She took the opportunity to become a partner in a small business in early 2000. She discovered how unpredictable uh, the lead generation and profits were and decided to make an intense study of the industry. She worked hard and mastered all of the technical details of the business. With her toolbox filled with formal training, coaching, and implementation, she designed a system that could build a better business. Then she developed and integrated her new business model with an emphasis on referrals, and over time, her consistent, reliable, and predictable marketing strategies created clearly defined roles for all operational components of the company. And so you will find out more about her during this wonderful presentation, System Think, Real Skills for Life. Thank you so much. So is it is it me? I'm ready to start now. All right. Okay. So yes, what we're going to focus on today, and thank you so much for that introduction. I really appreciate it. And I'm happy to be here with everybody. What we're going to focus on today is how we can help our kids how happiness and real life thinking skills are intertwined. And that's what uh, we're gonna be going over today. So throughout the presentation, I am going to ask um, some thought provoking questions. So if you have something to write with, uh, pen, paper, not a tiny sticky note, but something that you can really keep notes on or maybe um, electronic or digital application, that'd be awesome. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get my screen shared and we will start. And then just to let you know as well, uh, Deborah said that at the end, uh, we're going to go ahead and do Q&A. So if you think of a question during the presentation, go ahead and drop it in the chat room and then we'll answer as many uh, that we can at the end. And if we don't get to all of them and some are directed towards me, I would be more than happy to uh, answer those later on uh, in an email or however best it would be to correspond with you. All right. So first off, okay, that's not going to forward. How come? All right, here we go. In our time together, we're gonna to go over a little bit and I just got that introduction, but who I am and what's going on. We're gonna talk about why is it happening? How do we fix it? And then how do we close the gap and what's next? And this is all about helping our kids be happier and learning system think. All right, so here comes your first question. What are you looking to get out of being here today? Are you here? for your own growth, to help or support somebody else, to learn something new. Maybe you wanna change, maybe you're just passing time or somebody else suggested that you be here. So if you wouldn't mind just taking a second and jotting that down, it could be more than one. And then I'd like you to answer the next questions. Are you committed to make the most of this time, to stay focused and engaged, and to take what you learn and apply to at least one area of your life today, and to share at least one idea with someone else. So if you wouldn't mind answering those for yourself, and if there's somebody who'd like to share their answer, that'd be awesome. Just go ahead and unmute yourself. No share? I will, real quick. I like that you ask us if we're committed. I feel like all of a sudden, Yes, I'm committed now. I didn't know I was, so you asked. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. Yeah, sometimes it it does take that. It takes a conscious out loud or to write stuff down. You know, we're less apt to violate things if we actually write it down. That's why it's real important to do that. Thank you for sharing. All right. I don't know why it is doing that to me. All right, so what's my story? I am from California. Don't hold that against me. A lot of people don't like California, but I am from Southern California and I've been here in Colorado for the last 10 years. So I went to college uh, in California. I was recruited out of college to be uh, in the insurance industry. I had a lot of years uh, with a big corporate background. I was in management and uh, had moved up you know, from frontline technical work and then I met my uh, 
husband to be. And he had just gotten into uh, the real estate industry. And I saw how, you know, I was getting up so early and going to work every day. And he was kind of lounging around and then being able to go to his own office. And that looked pretty appealing. Um, I stayed in the corporate industry for quite some time until after I had our second daughter. And then I decided that it was time. I wanted to be home. I wanted to be home with my kids, raise my own kids, uh, but still I am a working person. I love to work and I wanted to be able to do both. So I quit my corporate job and I joined him uh, to help build our family business. And that was awesome. And for a few years, it was great. I had my um, third child, my son, and we were going right along like every other family, just working and building a family and all that kind of great stuff. And then, unfortunately, um, we had what I call a change in family structure. That's what I like to call it. Um, my husband, um, for lack of making it any flowerly verbiage, he decided that drugs and alcohol were more important to him um, than being um, part of making and continuing a stable family structure. So uh, that rapidly changed my life. Uh, I was in California for a couple more years after that until the judge uh, gave myself a move away order. He granted me full uh, custody of my kids, uh, legal and physical. And so my husband fought for the business and the money. And I fought for my children and I, you could say we both won. So I moved out here to Colorado. And when I came out here, I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do. Um, he had the business and uh, I, my part of the business was actually growing the business. Um, I wasn't too fond of the industry itself, but I really enjoyed growing the business. So when I came out here, I decided to go ahead and reinvent myself. And the way I was able to do that was because I learned how to system think, which is what we're going to be you know, continuing to talk about through this whole presentation. So I decided I would be a coach. I wanted to teach people how to build businesses. You know, In school, uh, you don't get taught you can go to business school and um, business management, but you don't really get taught what it's like to be a business owner. And that is what I wanted to help people to do. It was uh, a lot of hard knocks to learn it myself. And I wanted to go ahead and help others do the same thing. So when I came out here, I went back into insurance for just a couple of years. I started my own consulting business. And then after three years, I was able to quit um, corporate life again. And then I've been doing this full time uh, since. So what's been really exciting about that is I've been able to work with a lot of successful uh, small business owners, help them structure their business so that they're not consistently always in the day to day operation, meaning just getting so burned out on just doing the do that they haven't had they didn't have the opportunity to grow their businesses the way they wanted to, to spend the time with their families like they wanted to, and to explore other areas of their life like they wanted to. So that's what I've been dedicating my life um, doing all these last years, and it's been fantastic. This last December, I had, um, we had a difficult situation happened. My son, who uh, was a junior in high school last year, he had a second friend uh, take his own life in December. And the first one did two years ago um, in his freshman year. And then this one did in his junior year. And um, it was extremely difficult. It brought up a whole lot of painful conversations um, with my son. Um, he said several times uh, and close to the event, you know, that uh, he, if his friends didn't find a reason to be here or a purpose, you know, what was his? And it hurt a lot uh, to hear my son talk like that and to have to not just have a solution for him, but to be able to sit through the conversations and hear him out. And I realized that 
what I have been helping adults do, you know, 30 year olds, 40 year olds, 50, 60, 70 year olds learn uh, how to structure thoughts and how to system think uh, mainly uh, towards, um, well, their personal lives, but their professional lives. And to hear my son struggling uh, with the same thing. I mean, well, of course, you know, he's only 16 years old at the time. And um, I thought right in that moment that what I've been teaching adults that, you know, young adults need to learn. And, and even my uh, clients, you know, had said on several occasions have said to me, gosh, you know, if I would have known all of this that you are teaching me now when I was younger, the heartache I would have saved, uh, the time, you know, the money, you know, all the different things that if I would have learned these things early, I could have structured my life. I could have lived a life um, uh, more towards their best life, what they really wanted. So my son is my compelling reason. I don't know the way my pictures are as it's covering up. My son is this one here um, with the black cat. And what I kept hearing from him is, you know, he doesn't like school. And the big resounding thing was, I'm not happy. That's just what I kept hearing. It's so heartbreaking. I'm not happy. He felt dumb, especially because of the way um, school changed with being online and all of the different um, obstacles, you know, that there were uh, to overcome to learn that new environment. He was so overwhelmed, couldn't focus. Um, he said he was felt depressed, you know, because he had no clear direction. He was very anxious about his future. And again, what was his purpose? And not knowing, you know, what does he really want to do? And afraid to even say it because um, typical um, pathways, you know, or one way, you know, go to college, you know, do this kind of thing. And, and that was really stressing him out, thinking that that school is not his favorite, never has been, and thinking that that was the only way, you know, to do something. Um, you know, how would he do that? And who's going to help? And uh, it, uh, it was very eye opening for me. And so at the beginning of this year, I decided um, to go ahead and take this program that I have been successfully teaching um, business owners and take part of it and put it into a student version to teach uh, students, young adults. Um, there are uh, ways to live their best life um, on their own terms. Um, so I just really love helping people get unstuck, you know, out of what they feel that, um, they're so tangled in current situations that they can't really see their way out of it. They, they feel that what um, they know today is what they're going to know forever. And they're not focused on the um, development, you know, of their talents and aspirations for a happier and more fulfilling life. So that is my compelling reason. And, you know, I've, like I said, I've worked with business owners and I've also worked before I went out um, on my own. I coached uh, corporate employees as well, just to learn that um, their time in a corporate, in somebody else's, you know, organization environment, that there is more that they can do um, to make their professional life more satisfying. So now again, it's your turn. What's your current story? I told you who I am and what my story is. And so in a few sentences, I'd like you just to take a little bit and write down again for yourself. Who are you? You know, I, I, I love putting things to songs, but that old who song, you know, who, who, who are you? I can't sing, so sorry about that. Um, you know, and I really want to know. Well, I do really want to know. But what's more important is for you to really know. Because going through life and making changes, um, whether they're good or bad, or we don't label them at all, they just are what they are, we really need to know where we're starting from. So let's acknowledge, I want you to acknowledge right now, you know, for your baseline, um, who you are and what's your story. So if you just take a minute, and then again, I would love it if somebody would, would share. So let me know if anybody would like to share. I would like to share. Awesome. This is Dr. Martin, I'm a great grandmother raising an eight-year-old, a six-year-old, and a one-year-old. Wow. In a 
a generation now that's gifted but guilty that most of them don't even have a relationship with God and and trying to help I'm an international missionary and you know I just want the best you know for the children because even the young children you know they they have idea thoughts of suicide I was listening to your story it's not only with the teenagers or little ones that a little older, but uh, even the the younger children, they be saying things to one another that I don't know. But and I, as I was listening to you, it was just just awesome. I mean, and how you came through it, and you made it through it, and you're going to give me the stamina to do the same thing. That's so. That's who I am. You know, Lord, what can I do? What can I do to make things better for these children? I work in the uh, Philippines, and you know where they some of them have to pay to go to school and start prostituting at six and eight years old, and then when I come back to the states, you know, and then have mine to 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 rear. You know, so where do we go from here? And I was just I'm just listening and. I want us to gain and glean from this this evening. You know, what can I do better? Or what am I not doing that I can do better? And so, yeah, that's where I'm standing. Yep. Thank you. I really appreciate your sharing. It's it's difficult, you know, until until that happened for the second time to my son's friend. Um Again, it wasn't something that, you know, I really, I don't know, wanted to address, you know, you hope that uh, everything's just going to be okay. And you kind of, um, uh, I'm guilty of it, just kind of presuppose that, you know, my kids would just make it through these difficult years and just kind of learn some of the stuff on their own. And then, like I said, it just hit me and I thought, you know, <laughs> I'm with adult. I didn't learn it on my own. You know, I, I read a ton. I, I, I immersed myself in that kind of learning so I could teach others. And it, it's, you know, we teach our kids how to swim uh, so they don't drown. Uh, we, we teach our kids, we have to have 50 hours, you know, of uh, driving time behind the wheel, you know, before they can get a license before they're 18. And yet, again, somehow we just think that they're just going to self-develop uh, their own uh, minds into uh, understanding what makes their life happy and how to train how they think. And um, nothing can be further from the truth. So I hope that, uh, you know, what I continue to share with you today helps. And I, again, I appreciate you sharing. So let's go on to the next slide. Uh, is there oh, any way that ahead. I could share for a yes, minute? Please. Um, uh, I have a 17 and an 18 year old and my 18 year old, we've been doing really well. He's developmentally delayed. He's um, lower spectrum autism and he's, we've been doing really good having him all the way through mainstream school. Now that he's 18, he had, when he turned 16, he suddenly developed um, adolescent epilepsy. When he was younger, it was it was easier to help him go through things. And now that he is 18, he's having a harder time with friends and he's having a harder time with socializing. And now that he has adult onset epilepsy, he's had driving taken away. He's and he is now this just angry boy. And, but then a few minutes later, he's okay. So it was easier when he was a baby and it was easier when he was a kid. But now that he's this young man, I don't know what, how to talk to him. <laughs> so it's really nice to, to, to kind of hear that it's all around the spectrum, younger and older. And it's nice to know that there's a lot more resources so that there's definitely something out there. It's just making sure that he can be a part of that. Yeah. Yes, thank you so much. I appreciate hearing your story. Um, it is difficult and, and 
I, I joked with my, my clients, you know, and they say, well, what kind of coach are you? And I'm like, well, you know what? I'm more of a director because I actually, I, I like to direct. I like to, I, I, I know what's, you know, needs to happen and I like to move things along. And with my kids, I discovered that, uh, and, and with a lot of adults, it doesn't work so well. It's a lot of just closing this and listening. Um, and I just keep learning more and more. My eldest now is going to be 21 and my middle daughter is going to be 19. And then my son just turned 17. And more and more, they're teaching me that um, just kind of like in marriages, I hate to say that because I don't have one anymore, but it's a lot about um, not having the solution in the talking, but just listening and then asking, asking if they want help. That's what I've learned to do a lot more. I've learned to listen and then just ask when they're done to say, I hear what you're saying. That's difficult. You know, um, would you like my help? I have some suggestions if you would like it. And if they don't want it, then I've learned to say, okay, because a lot of times they will come back later and say, well, you know, when I told you about this, well, what would you do? You know, but in the moment, they just want to be heard. So that's my two cents on, on that. Um, okay, so what's going on out there? And when I mean out there, you know, out around us in our environment. Well, one third of our lifetimes we're spent, our, we spend at work, you know, and are working. And there's two thirds of us that are dissatisfied with our work. 13% are downright miserable. A recent study just in the last few years, say four out of 10 college students graduate, graduate without enough system thinking skills to even manage white collar work. And that's from the employers. That's the poll from the employers. And on a personal level, over half of us are divorced at least once. So why are so many in the workplace dissatisfied? And why are so many college students not equipped after they graduate? And why do so many relationships fail? Well, I'm going to suggest that it's because we get trapped in an other directed life because we don't have the real skills to be successfully self-directed. And so what I mean by other directed is just like it sounds. It's, a, it's following an established path of someone else's ideas. It's easier to do, it is, you know, than blaze our own trail, right? And especially when we don't have the skills to understand how to successfully blaze our own trail. And notice not everybody's dissatisfied. I mean, there are people who are very happy with their work, very happy in all their relationships and they're content. And if it's not broken, there's no reason to fix it. But for those, you know, who aren't hundred percent satisfied and we have a pull to do more, you know, whether it's in on our own or in somebody else's organization, if we're talking about our professional lives, you know, um, you know, the other thing is, is coming into the, now being in this 21st century, um, it's not good enough just to have an education. Um, we need to be problem solvers and it takes system think skills to be a problem solver. Um, again, you know, in, in our current era and moving forward, it's about our usefulness for other people. And we're gonna talk more about how to become more useful, but it, it is about problem solving. So, you know, let's talk about, um, let's talk about one of the big consequences, you know, of living uh, an, an other directed life. You know, one of the biggest consequences is that we're extern externally motivated. And again, I know it's pretty self-explanatory, but what I mean by that is when we are not following, you know, our own passion, our own purpose, and we are following somebody else's, um, we look for um, ratification. We look for 
pats on the back. We look for other acknowledgement to tell us we're doing okay. And what happens is when we're looking outside of ourselves for those things is we get disappointed, right? Because people are not always going to give us the at a boy, at a girl, and, you know, or the monetary compensation, you know, that we deserve for, for the growth that we've done in a company or whatnot. And then getting disappointed um, is because we don't have control over that. And then sometimes that can lead to like this power stress, you know, right? Because we, we want to control things that really we have no business to controlling. We can only control ourselves. So, I don't know if you've ever heard this, but one of the things that I always um, liked and always stuck with me is that, you know, then we get these expectations um, of what others should be doing to feed us because we're not feeding ourselves with our own internal motivation. And when we have expectations, what they really are is they're just premeditated resentments. So think about that for a second, because that is what happens to us. Um, and that is why we get disappointed when we don't get something that we think we should have had. And that is a big problem uh, when we are living a other directed life and not a self-directed one. So the, here's a song I, I, I talk about, you know, trading dreams, right? Because we all have our own dreams and, and following a dream of our own is being self-directed. And this song by um, Judah and the Lion called Suit and Jacket. I just love this um, chorus because as you can see, it's not trading my youth for no suit and jacket, not trading my dreams for a 401k. How am I supposed to slow it down so I can figure out who I am? And like the lyrics you know, say, I mean, it really speaks to what we're talking about. When we trade our dream for our life, for what others, you know, maybe think we should do, or just a road that somebody else has made up, because it's a well-defined path, you know, or or we're trading for a lesser goal, um, like money. Money is a lesser goal than what our purpose is, than what our gifts and talents are. Money uh, is important. Money buys comfort, and it's the way we do things in this world. But it's not the number one thing. And for a lot of people who, again, trade their dream um, for a well-established, you know, position, um, it can it can lead to a lot of other problems along the line as far as unhappiness. And so, you know, these last lines are, you know, how am I supposed to slow it down to figure out who I am? Well, the answer is learning a proven method of system thinking for taking a dream and following all the way through to reality. So next we're gonna talk about a tale of different eras. So once upon a time, you know, way, way back when my, my son would say in dinosaur times when I was born, loves to do that to me. Um, we traded skills, right? You know, um, I raised cows, sold milk, you know, one of you uh, sold clothes, you know, somebody else um, raised, uh, raised, you know, or farmed, had corn, you know, whatever it was, and we traded skills. Well, then the industrial age came and that changed everything. And we now traded time for money. We went to jobs. Formal education was to train us on how to be employees. And just like how, you know, we were just talking about a few minutes ago, the 21st century now demands to have problem solvers, to have people who have an entrepreneurial spirit. And when I, or an entrepreneurial mind, when I say entrepreneurial, that doesn't, necess ne that doesn't necessarily mean owning your own business. Um, being an entrepreneur is finding a problem that's out there and then working on a solution and bringing that to the marketplace. And that doesn't mean again, that you have to own your own business. A person can be entrepreneurial in someone else's organization. They've just decided that they are going to become more useful and not just do the day in, day out, clock in, clock out and go home. But the thing is, is even though the 21st century is demanding of, of problem solvers, Formal education is still in the industrial age. We're still getting um, schooling and uh, by just trading specific knowledge. That's, that's what school is kind of all about still. And I got to see a lot of that this last year when my son was at home. 
And I was online with him seeing some of the things that um, they were still teaching. And no wonder he's frustrated. I, you know, I was frustrated too, to be quite honest. Um, and nothing, you know, towards him and his interests and how to develop him to be useful, to really contribute, to be a problem solver. So education is wonderful. I just don't feel that it is always the plan, but it's definitely a good part of a plan if it fits into what a person wants to do in the future. Uh, because obviously there are lots of careers and industries that do demand um, a higher education, you know, a college education or beyond. And if that is part of, you know, the plan of what somebody wants to do, then that is fantastic. There just are other ways of getting educated and learning how to system think um, can put somebody in a much better position um, for being uh, and living a happier and successful life in their personal and professional lives. So let's now, do, does anybody have any questions right now before I move on? Okay. All right. So professional life choices. So we already touched on this a bit. There, there are a few, right? So we can work in someone else's organization and we can work there being a non-system thinker or a system thinker, or we can have our own business and same thing. We can be a non-system thinker or a system thinker. Now let's talk about the difference. Now, first off, I mean, everybody has their own unique set of talents and aspirations, and it's up to the it's up to the individual to decide on how much that they really want to extend and share their abilities, you know, with everybody else, right? And how much they're going to be useful. Developing oneself, like we talked about, just beyond, you know, being um, reactive, just working um, as things come, you know, at us and moving into being proactive increases our level of usefulness. So let me explain. First, let me talk about um, categorizing time. I learned a long time ago to think about time in three different, I put up four, but I mean three, three different ways. And I call them the three R's. So one is results time. And results time is when we are just living life. Uh, we're doing the things that we have to do to keep going, you know, right? We're uh, making dinner, going grocery shopping, cleaning house, stuff in our personal life uh, that way. In our professional life, we're showing up, we're clocking in, we're doing the day-to-day, -day, you know, operations, tasks that we're given to do, and we clock out and we go home. When we're, um, that's results time. That's just like working in our lives and our business, our work. Then there's remodel time. And like the name suggests in contracting, that's when we improve things, right? We make things better. And remodel time in our personal lives would be when we say, you know, I can never find anything in that pantry. It is such a mess. So what I'm going to do is take everything out. I'm going to clean it. I'm going to organize it. And I'm going to put everything like this and like this. Because now when I go to make dinner or when I go grocery shopping, it's like that, right? Everything's organized nice and neat. And I'm not fumbling through buying stuff for the third time. It's all packed in the back that I didn't see. Another thing uh, or example of remodel time is at work. Same kind of thing. You know, gosh, this takes me an hour to do this specific task. But if I made myself some templates or I made myself uh, a workflow, I could get through this much faster. I could do it in half the time. And then I would have more time to do something else. That's working on, right, improvement. And then the third kind of time is recovery time. And like it suggests, it's time away, right? It's time to back off, right? Have a personal day, vacation, friends, family, enjoying other aspects uh, of life that you really like to do that make you you. All right. So we've categorized time, okay? Now, when we're working in somebody else's organization, you know, we typically get hired. Let's talk about our, our children, our students, our kids, you know, get hired and get paid, right, um, above what they're really worth, right, when we're just coming out of school or high school, because we really don't have the experience. But 
the employer's taking a chance, right? Putting us in their organization and they're paying us and then they're training us to learn. Now, a lot of people just stay at that level. I've been trained, I'm just gonna do what I do and that's, and that's it. That's staying reactive, that's staying just being in results time. So how do we become more useful to our employer? And by the way, staying there, typically what happens is as we grow, right, in our tenure um, with working in somebody else's organization, uh, now our experience starts outweighing what we're getting paid. And that's how the system works because your employer needs resources, right, to keep moving forward. So people in somebody else's organization who are system thinkers, what they do is they figure out a way, right, to become more useful so then they can get, and this is typically, so they can get um, moved up the ladder, right? Whether they go in management or they go in another type of technical position, but that has more responsibility. And then along with that, they get compensated for it. So there is, you know, an example of a non-system thinker and a system thinker in somebody else's organization. Well, the same thing happens when people own their own businesses. And that's typically when people start asking me to come help them. Sometimes they realize it at two or three years in. Other times it's 20 years and they're finally saying, I'm burning out. I can't do this the way I'm doing this anymore. Uh, I'm just being reactive. And when they're being reactive in their own business is that they went into business, you know, um, just doing what their, their skill set, um, uh, their craft, and then they start getting clients. And then now they're just, you know, dog paddling, right? They're just dog paddling through life. And they don't get to the point of being proactive where they put together the systems and the processes to help them streamline, to help them to have predictable and consistent customer service. So then they can delegate right, to other people and or tools, and then they can rise higher in their own organization, right, to really wear the CEO hat and to grow and develop and be more creative and the visionary of their business, instead of being at the front line for 20 to 30 years and burning out um, at best or losing the business at worst. So that's just a discussion on um, professional life choices. And, you know, I have a ton of stories uh, as far as people that I've helped um, get, uh, you know, from where they were to where they wanted to be. Uh, I had a gentleman that I started working with about five years ago. That was five years into his profession, and he was doing that dog paddle. I mean, he wore every hat: the marketing hat, the CEO hat, um, you know, the lead janitor hat, um, the sales hat. Um, the contractor hat, I mean, absolutely everything until we got him into system thinking and to putting all of his systems together. Well, fast forward, he now has um, two employees. He still has uh, a, a small, a small ish business, um, but uh, monetarily wise, it's a large business. Um, he's been able to streamline it um, so well that now he has bought a big motorhome and he is going to be doing his part of the business now the ceo part on the road so he takes off october 1 for three months and that has always been a dream of his um, there's just so much more of life that can be enjoyed when we start system thinking and we get these real life skills which we're going to be getting to a little later on in the presentation i have another woman who um she graduated from college many years ago uh, with a marketing degree. She went into uh, someone else's you know, organization to work for a very large employer, it was very good, but not in doing her profession of choice. Uh, she was in administration, she made good money, uh, but after years, she just didn't like it, wasn't feeling fulfilled. So she ended up quitting. She and her husband started their own business and now she is doing all the marketing. So not only is she using her degree, but she's also her own boss. And all of that, you know, um, she was able to reinvent herself um, because she was able to system think. She was able to take her idea and take it all the way to implementation through planning and implementation. 
And that is where the majority of us fall short. Um, everybody has ideas of what they really want to do. It's planning and executing. And that's the system think part. Um, so, and you know, even um, individuals who work for um, and have stayed working in other organizations that I've helped recently, um, one gal, she was just, I mean, in tears almost all the time. It, it's her employer who I uh, consult with, but he asked me to work with her. Uh, she just had a very difficult time putting together a workable schedule um, and being able to balance her time. And I spent three or four weeks with her teaching her the system thinking. Now she's got a schedule that she can manage. Um, we've even cut down her time coming back to the warehouse. Um, she's a field person. And um, she is now going to even take on some different um responsibilities that she actually really wants to learn um, instead of just doing her day-to-day -day stuff that she was struggling with just keeping up. So it makes a real big difference um, to be able to system think. All right. So it brings me to another topic I wanna to talk about and that's the two commodities and our two most precious commodities of you know, like working, I guess, if you will, is time and money. And the thing is, is money is fluid, time is not. So to piggyback off the last slide, you know, when we're able to collapse the time that we spend in result time, remember, that's the just the day to day stuff, um, just the getting the work done. We not only like in work increase our hourly rate, right, because we're collapsing and we're able to get things done faster. So our hourly rate is going up, but we're also building much more space in our time for the other aspects of our lives that we want to enjoy. So I want to talk about this idea for just a minute, because I, I think we get tripped up um, on believing that if we just, you know, maybe had more education, you know, or, um, or you know, uh, whatnot, that uh, we would automatically make more money, you know, um, and the individuals, you know, the few that I've just talked about, I mean, they all have different levels of education, but what's really made the difference in their lives is being able to uh, structure their time so they can have more time in more important areas of their life. And when, when I say important areas, they want to explore areas, they want to expand their usefulness in, whether that's family, whether that's their education, whether that is their work, whatever that looks like, they've been able to do that because they have learned to system think. And let's talk, here's an interesting thing about money. And um, the economist, Arthur Brooks, um, he studied the effect of generosity on income. And he concluded that the, um, the greater effect um, is, is on generosity affecting income, not the other way around. So generosity affects income by 37%. So for every dollar donated, income would go up, increases on an average by $3.75. But conversely, income affects generosity by only 14%. So for every extra dollar earned, giving only went up by 14 cents. So when do we tend to be more generous? Well, I suggest it's when we're happier in our lives. Again, when we're being more useful, when we're doing the things in our lives that make us feel important, um, that fulfill our talents and our aspirations. Now we're gonna do another exercise. All right, so name three times in your life where you had to make a decision about spending money that you thought might really cripple your current state of existence and or your future. I know I've had those where it's like, oh, are you kidding me right now? I have to spend money on what? Or this is gonna cost me what? And then after you've listed those right beside it, what happened? Like, are you still here? I think you are. Are you still eating? 
You know, the point is, is that money one way or another has somehow come back around to have you here today. And then next, I'd like you to name three times in your life where you wish you would have made a different choice about how you spent your time. Maybe it was who you chose to spend it with, what you were doing, or where you were. And then did you get those moments back? I mean, I'll admit, myself included, I get worked up about money uh, more often than I should. But really, the time, our time is so much better spent when we focus on spending our time more wisely because the dollars will follow. They just do. So is there anybody who'd like to share their their answers and or any experience around these questions? I'm not sharing completely. I do wanna let you know that there are shares in the chat. Okay. okay. Okay, great. Um, maybe just um, wasting time and spending it with people that um, don't deserve it. Yep. Yeah, and that's one thing that my mom ta taught me and I loved it. She's like, you know, Rhonda, when you're an adult, she's like, you can make those choices. And sometimes it is hard to do, but we can make those choices of being with people who uh, lift us up, right? And to yeah, be one of those that are people. Being around people that are positive and try to stay around those type of people and negative people kind of leave them behind because we have the choice to surround ourselves with the people that we want to, we have control of our lives. So we don't have to be around or give attention to people that are negative. Yes, ma'am. That's absolutely right. And that's true. And another thing I like to say, even <clears throat> when you brought that out, when we focus on spending time wisely, uh, and even with people that you love, sometimes we get so busy. I mean, Jesus rested. <laughs> but we get so busy that, you know, we don't, even with family and that, I mean, I know I've been guilty of that, uh, you know, and for a lot of years. I mean, just drown myself in work and this and that and, and, and never time even for yourself or uh, for people that you love or you know mm -hmm. and that's we need to just regroup and revamp I like yeah, to do this yeah that's so true and it is it, it's, it's just like uh, you know we're just busy you don't have time to do this no I can't do this I gotta work I gotta do this and um how I mean what can you just anyone just help me <laughs> because i i'm i'm really guilty of that i would when say break it down um uh, break it down to to the people that really matter and then you'll realize that sometimes some of the time that you're wasting and letting people control you by pulling you here and there you don't have to you don't have to you can eliminate those people and make sure that you spend it with the people that are important okay. i have I have one I want to share that's sort of along the same lines, but also kind of different. Um, there have been some amazing people um, in the last couple of years come into my life that I have asked to mentor. And then I didn't take the time to actually follow up with them. And now it would be really weird to go back and say, hey, remember when I asked you to mentor me like a year and a half ago? <laughs> like, I really mean it now. But I didn't step into that because I was like afraid of stretching myself and the challenges that these people brought um, because it would it would boost me into a different lifestyle that I'm comfortable in. And so I wish looking back, I would have made a different choice about the time about the time that I spent and would have actually invested in um, seeing where those mentors took me. Maybe you can call them. It's worth a try. You never know till you ask. The only thing I agree. If they said no. yes once, they'll say yes again. Mm -hmm. 
I can't think of three times, but I do remember like one of a time that really stood out to me was like when I was in college um, and I was 17 and my parents had to go out of town for a family emergency because one of my grandparents was passing away. And it was kind of my first time being alone. And I was working, I was also doing my last year of high school all at the same time. And I was in my first year of college. And I remember I, well, I ran out of gas or I was almost out of gas in my car. And I go to school or skip school and go to work and then see if my boss would pay me. And I didn't know what to do. Um, and it really wasn't an option to skip school. Like it would have gone on my record for skipping school. And so I just kind of prayed about it. And like in those situations, like when I don't know what to do about money and time and whatnot, like I just prayed about it. And I don't know, I went to school and I sat through class and it's kind of hard to focus. I'm like stressing out the whole time. And my parents didn't have phone service. So I couldn't exactly ask them to send me money because where they were, they didn't have phone service. And so, um, I finished class, I walked out to my car and I got in the car and then I just sat there. I'm like, I don't have gas to get home. I don't have gas to get to work. I don't know what to do at this point. And all of a sudden somebody knocked on the window of my car and I put the window down and it was my college professor. And he handed me $60 and just said, hey, God told me to give this to you. And it was the craziest thing. And from then on, like that was just like one of the biggest life-changing moments for me. Um, it's just when I don't know what to do, I don't stress because when it, whenever it's come down to it, like I've always realized from that moment, God's going to make something happen. He's not going to leave me stranded. He's not going to not take care of me. Like he genuinely cares and he'll take care of me when he wants to, um, not when he wants to, but when like just trusting him mm -hmm. and seeing that I trust him, he will take care of me and whatnot so that was kind of I don't know really three things but that's always been something that I've remembered my whole life um because that was like my first time like being alone and everything else and I was just like I kind of had to stop putting my faith in people around me because I really had nobody at the time so I love that thank you thank you I would love to share if you guys would like to listen yes um Geez, I've been through so much in my life, it's kind of hard to, to pick things. Um, you know, I've, I've died and I've been to heaven and, you know, um, a lot of my decisions, you know, as, as I matured, um, you know, there's, there's things that I do look back on and things I don't. And, you know, I was always the pessimist. And one thing God taught me is he's faithful and that he is the reason we get through these things. If you're biblically based, I know it's the truth in my life. Um, one thing that, you know, I've always done is beat myself up. And, you know, I, I think that personally, I never gave enough credit to myself for the things I did do. And, you know, I look at it this way, everything that I have done right and wrong has done something for me in way, shape or form of teaching me a lesson for other times or just, you know, maybe even if it's just humility or just patience, um, you know, some of the examples, you know, my, my daughter's supposed to get tested. I've had to fight and be an advocate, you know, um, seeing if my daughter has a delay or, you know, um, a learning disability. And, um, you know, I've been doing the speech therapy in the OT and, you know, I'm sitting here beating myself up and I'm like, well, what else could I have done to help? Like, when, you know, you kind of really just come down on yourself and you don't show yourself grace. So I guess what I'm trying to say, shh, what I'm trying to say is, I'm trying to look at things more optimistic and try to see what God wants me to see in the situation or the choices that I've made. 
And, you know, I'm just personally, I'm working on the grace thing for myself and the empathy. And then, you know, trying to show others the same thing. Um, just trying to be there for people and, you know, listen to God's voice, you know, try and do as he wants us to do. But that's kind of in a nutshell, like my life kind of right there. <laughs> Thank you, Candace. Thank you. Okay. So now we're going to talk about what's going on in here. So we talked about what's going on outside of us, but what's going on inside, right? So a lot of it is that we're just not focused, you know, and focus is the number one success habit. But here's the thing, it's focusing on the process, you know, the best athletes, they don't focus on the result, right? They have the preferred result of what they want. And just like all of us, we have a preferred result. But when we can focus on the process, it makes us so much happier and engaged. And that's what makes us exceptional is when we can stay in the moment. You know, anxiety and depression and all that comes from living in the future or living in the past. And when we can stay present, and I like, you know, what, what the last few uh, ladies were sharing, it's true. When we can stay in this moment, in this moment that God gave us, that's what we're asked to do. And so focus helps us do that. Another thing that's going on, as we talked about this earlier, is that we are, uh, a lot of us have this external locus of control, right? We're looking for these outside things to, am I breaking up? You're good with me. Okay. You're good. Yeah, it's can... a little bit of static here and there, but you're good. Okay. Yeah, I just am hearing it now all of a sudden. I don't, don't know why. Uh. Okay. Um, so being, uh, externally focused, you know, carrots and sticks, right. We don't, uh, we don't do well with that. And then uh, having a fixed mindset, a fixed mindset is when we say to ourselves, you know, well, we just weren't born with this talent, you know, we're discounting, um, the discovery and development process and we're just staying on well, I don't have it. So how am I ever going to be able to do something like that? Um, we're concentrating on measuring talent or intelligence instead of developing them. And then another thing that's going on is having uh, no resilience, no grit. Um, and to uh, Candace's point a little bit ago was that, you know, when we have the uh, experience um, to be optimistic, how we get optimistic is by developing the skills uh, to overcome and to uh, problem solve. And that is how we build resilience. And so, you know, what we, what happens is when we're stuck, you know, in this not focused, you know, having this external um, locus of control, fixed mindset, lack of resilience, um, we don't navigate change well. We just double down on what we know instead of reinventing ourselves. Uh, we can't see ourselves doing anything else. Um, we get overwhelmed. Um, we don't explore challenges. You know, we don't achieve higher level, um, higher levels of success. And then we end up trading our happiness um, for money or some other substitute. So, you know, what we need is we need to develop a growth mindset, internal motivation, and grit. So why is this happening? Well, as we've been talking along, it's underdeveloped or undeveloped thinking practices, a lack of system thinking. And happiness also is undervalued and not well-defined. So we have a few things that are working against us. First of all, only 3% of the population are natural system thinkers, and the rest of us have to learn it. We talked about this before. Formal traditional education is for transferring specific knowledge on a given topic. 
it's also built around the concept of preparing us to fit into somebody else's organization, a well-worn path. It's not built to help us blaze our own trail. So consequently, you know, it's easier to fall in line on this well-defined path than it is to follow our own unique path, you know, based on our own talents and aspirations. As we just talked about, you know, so many people feel stuck because they're not following um, their God-given gifts, you know, of what they want to do. And they're not confident to pursue their own dreams. And so as it is, um, you know, there's another thing working against us, and that's all the noise that's out there. Not only the static noise. Has that gone away? That was like, <laughs> wow, for a minute. Okay. Um, yeah, the noise all around us and the constant bombardment, you know, of outside influences. And a lot of that, you know, it's that social norm, that social media influence. And I'm really not a big spokesperson one way or another about it. However, the biggest issue that I have with it, especially for our kids, is that constant barrage of comparisons, you know, which drives people's focus, their locus of control on external motivation, right? Oh, wow, you know, uh, Look at that person and, and look at look at what they're doing and I'm not getting fed and I'm not getting and and it is it's a horrible, horrible trap. And the thing about bad noise is that it's much stronger than good. You know, it takes five positive remarks from a significant person in our lives to outweigh just one negative remark. And it takes three positive experiences just to outweigh one negative experience. That's difficult to overcome. So when we have internal control, right, we can combat this because we're not looking for the sticks and carrots out there. We're not looking for comparisons. It's like when you get totally lost in something you love to do, right? that everything else just fades to the background. And that's what we want to teach our kids to be able to do in their lives over and over and over again. And stay away from the things that make them feel insecure. But it's hard to do that when they haven't developed the skills to take any idea that they have to be able to implement it. Okay. I don't know why I'm going backwards. I apologize. Do, 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 do. All right. So now we're going to talk about building muscle, a simple comparison. So biceps, we lift weights, right? For our brain, we system think. So let's take the first one. The first of why this is happening to us, right? The underdeveloped thinking practices. So when you think about building a muscle, you know, what's your first vision, right? I put biceps on there for you, but you know, what comes to mind? Can you totally picture an underdeveloped muscle and what that looks like versus a well-developed muscle? And so, you know, typically we know when we're big building our physical bodies, what our aim is, right? You know, we, we want to build endurance, you know, or we want, um, you know, to lose weight or we actually want to gain muscle, you know, or something, you know, along those lines. And then, and then we kind of plan on how we're going to do that, right? Well, that's going to be cardio or we're going to fix our diet, you know, or we're going to use weights, you know, and then how are we going to follow through, right? You know, we're going to establish a routine, maybe get a training partner, uh, you know, get a trainer, a coach, that's a self, a self, a selfless plug for me. So forgive me. Okay. So, you know, what are the results we get when we build muscle? Well, we get stronger, right? And when we get stronger, it builds our confidence. And when our confidence gets greater, we're able to take on bigger challenges, right? Natural. So what about our brains? Well, our brains aren't really muscle, they're an organ, but still, stick with me. They, they do grow. We're born with about a pound of a brain, and as an adult, it goes to three pounds. Again, how are we using it? You know, because here's the point. Our brains play the biggest role in our thoughts and our actions, 
And yet, again, we kind of just presuppose it's they're going to build them. It's going to build itself, right? But we don't presuppose our bodies are going to get stronger without doing something about it, you know, right? So, how is it that we do just kind of fall into that? Oh, the brain, you know, we're just going to go to school and we're just going to acquire knowledge, and it's going to propel us forward, but. Not really, because how much of that knowledge, you know, sometimes it's just fat. I mean, I hate to say it, but um, our brains a lot of times just become this place for storage. That's like its internal file cabinet of information. And brains weren't meant to do that. Um, they're meant for creativity. They are meant for problem solving. And if we don't educate them and we don't train them to do that, they do just become storage compartments for the most part. So system thinking, it's a workout. It's a workout for our brains. And it also has three parts to it. And we're gonna to get to this in just a little bit. And so when we build our thinking, our brain muscles, what we're really doing is we are getting more clarity and more control and more confidence. And that's really what is going on. Let's do another quick exercise. Name three things that you're currently doing to build your physical muscles and what is your aim? And then name three things you're currently doing to build your thinking muscles. And what is your aim for that? We each have 168 hours a week to spend. We're all gifted with the same amount of time. And again, how are we going to spend it? What do we really, really want? And if anybody would like to share, please go ahead. Um, I'll share. Um, I had um, a bariatric surgery on June the 3rd. Um, mm -hmm. I was cleared to uh, work out um, five weeks later. So since July... 11th, I joined um, F45, which is a, um, a fitness gym that um, is kind of like um, something like you have a personal trainer there with you. Um, it's a 45 minute, it's, it's called F45 because it's 45 minute classes that they have. Um, they do strength training or cardio, um, but you do have an assistance of trainers there who help you. So, um, I mean, I was pretty much yesterday was one year since I was in an auto accident. So, um, I wasn't able to do much. So I started going um, at first. I could only go like once or twice because I hadn't done anything, but for the past three weeks, I've gone at least six days, some days more in a row, um, because I'm trying to get stronger, um, and, um, increase my weight loss. And, um, I did join, um, <coughs> excuse me, go back to school. Um, I started GCU in January, um, to go back to get my degree. So I'm trying to, you know, exactly like you said, everybody has the same amount of hours every day. Um, and until you really kind of get that into your mind, you know, sometimes you think, well, other people could do this, or it just kind of depends on what you want. So um, I did start taking my daughter with me too. So sometimes we go at 515 in the morning. Um, sometimes we go at 615. So you can make time um, for things that you really want. It's just, you just have to commit yourself to doing it. So um, I've been pretty faithful to it. So um, I'm starting to see results. I think I lost like nine pounds within 25 days. So um, I'm just continuing to <laughs> go forward. That's awesome. And I like how you combined your time, you know, being able to spend time, quality time with your daughter and still get the workout done and teach her, right? Good habits. I mean, that's awesome that you were able to combine all that. I love it. Um, me and my friends are doing this. It's, you guys are all going to judge me when I tell you this crazy thing we're doing. It's called Hard 75. And so basically what you have to do is for 75 days, 
you have to work out for 45 minutes a day, two times a day. One of the exercises has to be outside. You have to read 10 pages in a book a day. You have to take a picture of yourself. Good job. You have to take a picture of yourself every day and you have to drink a gallon of water a day. So, and no alcohol and no like treats, like cakes, sweets, things like that. Cause you have to stick to a diet too. So, um, so I think even just doing that, it definitely made me see how much time in my day that, I mean, it's hard, but like that I can actually like work out and do things like that. And it's actually like getting me and my friends closer because we're doing it together. So we're able to say, okay, well, let's get together this week and hold each other accountable and work out and get my kids more active. So it's hard, but it's, it's being good. This is, we're on day 24, so. All right, congratulations. I love that. That's great. All right. Dick. Did somebody else want to share? Okay. All right. So we're rounding the corner. So happiness defined. So we talked about why this is happening, right? And then the last time we said, you know, we talked about how the underdeveloped thinking practices. And then the second reason is that happiness is undervalued or not defined, right? So let's go ahead and define it. And happiness is defined by three things, good social relationships, purpose, and a positive outlook. And we talked to Candace again, you know, she brought that up and, you know, learning to have a positive outlook is just that a lot of times it does take learning and system thinking helps do that. So, you know, um, we want to be able to define happiness for ourselves. And it is in this construct, but each one of us has our own definition of good social relationships. You know, again, we talk about positive people and people that bring us down. Um, we all have our own purpose, our own gifts, our own talents that we were given uh, to be useful to other people. Uh, you know, why we're here on this earth. And then a positive outlook, that's that grit, that's that resilience, that's learning and having a structure, a system for completing um, tasks, for getting ourselves from here to there. And the more often we do that, the more it boosts our positive outlook because we have the confidence that we can make these things happen in our lives. So again, what helps you actually live your best life? You know, learning to system think promotes living your best life because it develops learning how to successfully live a self-directed life by knowing how to successfully problem solve and to have the skills to make better relationships, fulfill your purpose, and have a positive outlook. Does that make sense? Okay. So pursuing your dream. Deepak Chopra, you know, he came up with this law of least effort. Oh, I didn't even know it was going to do that. <laughs> All right. And, um, law of least effort and purpose in life. And what he talks about is when you align working in your unique abilities, you know, further success is inherent because you're working not just for a paycheck. I mean, you're working um, based on what you know you're here to do. And when you do that, when you align your unique abilities with what makes you feel important, you know, there's no limit to what you can achieve. And that is what creating the life you want is all about. So what does all this do? Well, again, when we can system think, we develop clarity, the proper locus of control, internal versus external, and confidence, which promotes the three main components of happiness, better relationships, purpose fulfillment, and a positive outlook. So again, happiness goes up as our motivation goes more towards internal and our purpose goes up. And when we have a plan, right, to be able to execute, to implement, to actually fulfill our purpose and the ideas that we have for our life. So what does all this mean? 
well, our current environment needs an upgrade. <laughs> our focus needs to shift to a 21st century outlook, being problem solvers. We need to provide solutions. We need to teach real skills for youth to learn how to develop their own talents and aspirations. We need to talk about that happiness is a priority, not a pursuit. That money does take care of itself when we follow what our God-given talents and aspirations are and learn how to bring them to the marketplace. And our time, we need to guard it well. So let's talk about what these real skills for real life are. These are the benefits of learning how to system think. You learn to be focused. You learn how to be organized. Schedule control, that answers so much. Most people call it time management. I like schedule control because I like to be in control of my schedule. Because if I'm not, somebody else will be. It's having a growth mindset. It's being able to make better decisions. Being able to understand at the very beginning when you're confronted with something that it's a yes or a no. Because if we hesitate, more than likely, we're going to go down possibly a wrong path. And so when we understand who we are up front, we make better decisions. And we avoid decision fatigue. You know, that's one of the things in life. It's making those same decisions over and over and over again, because we don't have our goals clarified. We don't have our vision well outlined. And so day in and day out, we second guess ourselves. We're not trusting ourselves. And when we don't trust ourselves, we're not trusting in our creator. Our creator gave us a wonderful brain, a wonderful mind. Our job is to learn how to use it. Okay. Um, we're better able, or we're not able to cope when life, you know, is not clear. Um, so we want to make it clear. Uh, we're going to learn how to do bigger goals and actually achieve them. And be, be process driven. Again, not get so caught up in the result. We have a preference, obviously, for the result. But if we follow the process, we're going to end up achieving what we need to achieve. Real skills are forward movement habits. They include teaching leadership skills um, and learning leadership skills, build supporting or uh, building support systems, not only um, self-support systems, but uh, help getting others you know, enlisted to help us as well. Uh, implementation of ideas and again, internal motivation. So those are the skills that are learned with the System Think Solution. And the System Think Solution is a three-step process. First off, it is envisioning your future. It's all about discovery skills and learning those. And then develop strategies, and that's the planning part. And then building the systems, and that's the implementation part. We teach how to effectively pursue one's own interests by developing their ability to contribute to the needs of others. It's adaptive learning. It's focusing on long-term growth and how to deal with change and be able to reinvent oneself, how to make better decisions. It's discovery learning, how to take your idea and follow it all the way through. All right. So now we're going to talk about your future story. So we talked about your current. What do you want your future story to look like? Because what we do today, what we learn today, helps prepare us for what we want our future selves to be, our future lives to be. So in your future story, what do your relationships look like? And what are you doing to live in your purpose? And how do you feel when you're achieving your purpose? So if you want to take a couple minutes, Well, I feel wonderful when I'm achieving my purpose because I think we are born for purpose. And I like it. I, birth and 
I love birthing purpose and bringing out the best in others. And first I had to bring it out in myself. And I like that. Rel even with what your relationship look like. I mean, it's something about relationships and communication. And I don't know, we, everyone has, our, everyone is a unique individual. And God didn't give us all the same thing. And that's what make us great. But I, I just love just birthing purpose, you know, not only in myself, but helping others to do the same. I, I mean, it's just amazing when that happened. And I, I love the purpose that God has given me the things that God has given me to do, I want to fulfill the purpose. And, and, and I mean, just abide in my calling, do what, you know, what I'm supposed to do, not be bound by other men of opinion, opinion. Like like a lot of times I say real in brief, I said, you know, if somebody call your dog, you know, you don't walk around with four legs barking so you're going to abide in your calling and don't be bound by other men opinion but have good rela relationships I mean that means a lot communication means a lot and when you're doing that and living in your purpose I mean it's a happiness it's a fulfillment and it's just like who go to, go to work and some people say, even I've been in church a long time. I don't know what to do. How many of us have gone to a job and nobody told you what to do and you didn't know what to do? But I think that is the purpose that every one of us have. And when you find that purpose and abide in what you're supposed to be doing, not what other people think you should do or this and that and the other, I think it's, it's a fulfillment would you have to love what you're doing like you had said once earlier about your job and said even if it's you have to love even going to work some people hate even going to work what is your purpose for i mean what are you supposed to be doing mm -hmm. did you understand what i'm saying i do and uh, you know so what i mean what is your purpose for living what are you called to do what are you anointed to do I mean, what are you supposed to be doing? It's just like if you, you don't sing, why are you in the choir? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Why? Yes. You can't, I mean, come on. Maybe God, I mean, some people are anointed to teach school, anointed for behavioral uh, medicine. I mean, but what are you really called to do? Mm -hmm. What is your, what do you love? It's just like uh, MD, all of my MDs, but they go into a specialty. Mm -hmm. And if your foot hurt, you don't go to a cardiologist, okay? So, I mean, what, make your mind, what, what is it that you know that you've ordained and, and, and called or purpose to do? And let that purpose, birth that purpose out. Yep. And we all be guilt, I mean, come on. Just walking around like Alice in Wonderland, wondering what's happening next. We can't do that. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely. What, what, what are you supposed to be doing? And you know, like, you know, don't be bound by other men' opinion. Don't be, you know, don't major in minor things and don't minor in major. Mm -hmm. So you know, find out what what is it that you're really supposed to be doing. What yeah. makes you, you know, some we have so many unhappy people. I'm not kidding unhappy marriages, unhappy everything. I'm just happy, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I have a thing that's called no woman left behind. And I mean, I mean, still living in the past, still, come on, drive and go forward. Whatever your purpose is. If you don't know, ask God, find out your purpose. Yep. So, and then, um, then do it. So um, Rhonda, there's um, someone who wrote in the chat, I don't know what I'm supposed to do, not sure what I'm called to do. And, you know, some of us can figure that out, 
but um, I'm a single mom and too busy mothering that it feels that that's all I'm, I'm meant for. So I think it's important to um, also help those who may not know how to determine their purpose, how to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hear that. And in, in the System Think program, there is, a, we we're talking in the last slide, that first part is about discovery. And so there are different exercises and whatnot there. And I know that this program, I have it geared towards youth only because I have um, my kids in it, um, you know, to uh, make it interactive, but it is the same program that I do teach adults. And that is where we start right from the beginning. And it is to really look at ourselves and like we were talking about, you know, taking our unique abilities and aligning it because we all have unique abilities. And I couldn't have told you, I hate to say how long ago, but when I entered the workforce, that this is what I would be doing. Um, but the more and more that I concentrated on what made me happy, what made me feel important. You know, we all walk around with a sign on our head saying, make me feel important. You know, we do. And it's different for all of us. You know, some, some like administration work, you know, some with other people, some with, but we do that discovery work uh, to find that alignment um, of what, what we feel good in doing. And that alignment goes with that gift or gifts that we've been given. I mean, there are all kinds of things that, you know, each one of us are good at, but what really makes us feel that we are uh, living out our purpose. And that is part of that discovery process because it, it is a process. Some people, I know I, I have a doctor friend who he said when he was seven years old, he knew he was gonna be a doctor and he became a doctor, but that's not um, typical <laughs> for the majority of us. It's a process of figuring out, you know, what we like and what we want to be um, giving the world. And that's where we start. You know, I'm glad that you said that because even when I was young, uh, it's like in third or fourth grade or fifth, they had us to write what we wanted to be. And like you said, but, but everybody is not like that. But mm -hmm. from then I knew what I wanted to be. And uh, I just pursued and, you know, pursued even with the good, the bad and the ugly. Mm -hmm. But the final analysis of the technicalities, I, will, I became what I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. You know, they do your, few, you know, what do you want to be? Just like I asked my six year old here, uh, what I want to be a doctor and she keeps saying that and saying she's six you know saying that but now when she get of age you know it might be a horse of a different color mm -hmm. but it's something but another thing is to find yourself and how do you do that I mean you have to find you know because people I'm not kidding you some people can make you uh, you could be great it, it, it's just like we have I that that I uh I uh, mentor and then that I counsel uh, doctors and lawyers. I mean, th that some women, men, and make them think they're nobody and they're doctors. So, I mean, so how, and then especially if you have other people making you think that you're nothing and nobody, but you're great. You were born for greatness. Mm -hmm. But an uh, individual can make you feel like you don't, I mean, you just uh, uh, not even a bag of chips and all that. That's that noise we were talking about. Right, and so what, how, that's what I like to deal with, no woman left behind. Cause I mean, cause and to make, cause you, you are somebody. And there's something that God instilled in every one of us that the other one don't have. I'm telling you. Yep. You, I'm not kidding you. And that's the truth. It is absolutely the truth. It is absolutely the truth. And again, it, it's, it's an experiment, you know, I didn't, I, for me, I didn't come out of, you know, uh, high school or college saying, oops, someday I'm going to be coaching people on how to system think. I, I didn't even know what that was, but through following 
you know, what I was good at and what sat well with me through the discovery process, I was able to come to this place where I wholeheartedly believe this is what I was made to do. And, but it is, it is a process. So I just want to get, we're getting towards the end and, you know, this last part is just close the gap because you can, you know, if there is more you want for your life, go get it. You can do it. I've reinvented myself several times. I've had people that I've worked with reinvent themselves and it is absolutely possible. And it's what we're talking about today for our kids and, and those that we're responsible for. It is absolutely possible for them too. And the sooner that they learn the skills to do it, the happier they're going to be in their lives. So what's my best advice? My best advice is to provide your kids with the best opportunity to create happiness in their lives and teach them how to system think. It looks like I'm glitching again. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was just great. So many of you I know are probably feeling, you know, like this. A lot of times when we go through something new, you know, for the first time, we can get overwhelmed with, okay, well, that's a lot of information, you know, but um, what what do I what do I do with all of it? So if you give me just another five minutes, um, I got permission from Deborah, you know, to share with you today a program that I have and she liked it and I think you're gonna like it too. So Hopefully that's okay that I just take a couple more minutes of your time. So what's next? Well, I do have a program called Ronda Reddy University, and it's because it's based around the individual and what the individual's uh, purpose and ideas and vision are for their life. Um, who's it for? Uh, it's for people who want to struggle less. You know, it's for those who want to do more with their lives and they're not sure how to go about it. Um, what's included, it's over 40 uh, expert video sequential lessons. Near, well, nearly three dozen of those are videos. There are worksheets for action steps. There are lots of downloadable tools for offline learning. And there's an online portal to turn in work and get my coaching feedback. Uh, the cost is $300. I believe one's going to be uh, raffled off after I'm, I'm through presenting. And then um, if you enroll today, uh, you will receive uh, three one half hour extra one on one coaching sessions with me, which is a bonus value of $300. So I know throughout the whole time, there have been questions dropped in the chat. So um, I'm going to turn it back over to Deborah, and we'll go from there. And I appreciate your time, and thank you. Okay, Rhonda. So families, um, we want to um, give you an opportunity to apply for the, the scholarship that we're going to provide. Uh, we're going to drop the jot form link just been dropped in uh, the chat. And if you click on that, uh, then whomever uh, applies for it, then we will be giving one of those, um, one of Rhonda's um, trainings to someone in Parents Challenge. Uh, so all you have to do is just complete the jot form uh, for, for that. Uh, but again, one of the things that uh, she also offered that's not um, uh, for whomever signs up tonight. And those that are grant families, you can certainly use your grant dollars uh, for that. Uh, the form needs to be completed tonight because we will be selecting someone tonight. Um, and it, all it's asking for is your name and a signature that you're going to provide us some um, information on how you use the information that's been provided. So Someone asked in the chat, uh, when does the form need to be uh, completed? Immediately. Because you're gonna, so you can do the drawing right after, right? 
That's for right correct. now. Okay. As soon as, as soon before I send out the eval for tonight's session, we would have selected uh, someone based on those who apply. And all you're doing is giving us your name and, and signing a form. So if you're interested, click on the form and put your name in for the drawing. Aisha, were there any last questions that we didn't get to from the chat? I know you had uh, kind of kept track of those. Um, from my perspective, there are more comments, um, engaging comments as opposed to specific questions. But I probably need to go back through just to make sure that um, everybody has their voice heard, whether in this presentation or they're sent to the speaker for follow up afterwards. So I'm happy to do that. All right. Well, Rhonda, thank you so much for your presentation. You offered so many gems tonight. Lots of takeaway for us as we've um, done a lot of self-evaluation. And then you've got some great takeaways for us to really wrestle with over the next upcoming days, weeks, months. So we appreciate you so much being here tonight. Thank um, you. A final thing that um, if, if Aisha doesn't see any of those questions in there or Rachel, um, we had a drawing for door prizes tonight and we had three winners. Let me pull you up again. Um, Sierra Spencer is our first door prize winner. We had Shantina Lane and Lacey Bowman. So those, um, an Amazon gift card will be emailed to you. So congratulations door prize winners. Um, anything else, parent coordinators? Mm -hmm. Or anyone? I'm just, just, I was just going to say, um, just quickly, so off the um, things so that you guys can get in a chance to win. I just wanted to say thank you. Um, you were a great speaker and a good encourager um, that no matter what life does, strides, strides and strains to get to where you need to be, it is all possible. And you're a good example of that. So thank you for sharing tonight and hosting. Thank you, it was my pleasure. I enjoyed it. Excellent. And families, we got attendance. So I believe everyone is in good shape to log off now. Stop me if I'm wrong, anybody. <laughs> but I think we're good. Rhonda, okay. you can stay on for a second. Who is that? Parent coordinator? Rhonda. Oh, Rhonda. Rhonda okay. and parent coordinators. Great. Thank you to all the rest of you families for being here tonight. Good night. Good night. Job well done, Rhonda. And I've been sending messages to you to everybody <laughs> by mistake, but to you, but you did an awesome job. And I thank God for you because I've learned a lot. Thank you. Okay. Everybody be blessed. Yeah, be blessed. Awesome. Somebody wanted to stay and ask some questions. Is that okay? Sure. Okay. It was, uh, oh yeah, Laurel Ann. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I just thought that since we had the privilege of having you with us, Rhonda, um, it might be nice to have some dialogue about some of the things that you talked about tonight. Some of those questions were really, really good. Go ahead, Laura Ann. Um, I don't know that I had any necessarily straight off the bat, but um, just thinking through the, the different things that you thought about or that you presented to us, um, I thought it was interesting the correlation between the new eras, eras of the economy and also um, how that fits into system think. And I think um, it's been a challenge because I feel like we're right on the precipice of a new way of thinking 
Um, and so it's been a challenge to educate my kids into system think while I'm trying to learn it for myself because I definitely don't feel like an expert. And um, yeah, I guess that's my biggest, my biggest question about um, what you were talking about tonight. Yeah, so if I, I'm not sure if I'm hearing you correctly, but um, yeah, you know, it, school, it, it just really hit me seeing my, my son's curriculum <laughs> his junior year. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, you know, and, and some of the projects I thought, okay, you know, I, I understand what they're doing, but it's so routinized in just um, specific learning. And he was just not engaged with it at all. And I thought, right. God, you know, if we can just twist it, tweak it just a little bit towards what our kids are interested in, because they actually, just like we all do, they have a lot of talent, you know, they really do. And because it just doesn't fit, you know, a certain well-grooved path doesn't mean that they um, don't have a huge amount to contribute. And so really, I mean, moving forward, it really is about teaching our kids. Um, and, and I've learned this so much in helping uh, and being a business owner because you sink or swim, you know, by, by how you solve problems in the marketplace. Um, and so it just really hit me that, you know, at a young age, if they can learn, you know, how to take an idea, learn what it is um, that their unique abilities are, really, really embrace it, you know, and not feel that they have to fit in to what somebody else is telling them to do, but then have the skills to back it up. And that's the, that's the issue, you know, the skills of the planning, the organizing, you know, which all goes into um, being able to control our schedule, you know, being able to uh, elicit the right kind of support from other people to learn boundaries and limitations, you know, around um, for ourselves and all those kind of things, um, the leadership skills, was performance measurement, you know, and um, having a vision and being able to articulate that vision. Uh, and then, um, you know, having all of the uh, skills, uh, building skills for the follow through. So, yes, I mean, moving forward, and, and again, even in corporate America, you know, it's, um, it's more and more apparent um, that employers are looking for individuals who can think on their feet and who can bring more resources to their organization, not just follow the leader. I'll just do what I'm told and, and please just give me a paycheck so I can go enjoy my weekend. Um, that's all a, a, a um, industrialized outcome, you know, of learning and it's changing. It's definitely changing now. Uh, so to keep up, I mean, the new illiterate of the 21st century are going to be people who don't know how to system think. You know, it's not going to be reading and writing anymore. The, the threshold is going up. The bar is going up. So it's, it's crucial. And system thinking is not uh, difficult. It's discipline. And I know discipline is kind of a word people don't <laughs> really warm up to, but it is. It's just like going to, to the gym to work out, to do, it takes discipline, but pretty soon discipline fades away to routine, which fades to habit, you know, which fades to, it's just what we do. We don't, I'm sure each one of us don't get up in the morning and rethink every day our routine to get ready in the morning. If we did, we'd never get out of the house. You know, we just do it my muscle memory, you know, right? I mean, we brush, we do this, we do that, we do this. And that's where we want to get to as far as how we make decisions in our professional life and in our personal life as well. It doesn't, I had something long ago, oh, you're trying to turn me into a Johnny lunch bucket, you know, <laughs> by like following all these rules. And I'm like, no, what's, what's so interesting is the more you learn to system think, the more time you build for yourself to be creative. It's so I think from, I think for my family, you know, we've been homeschooling for like 20 some odd years. My oldest two have gone in and out of other kinds of, 
of schooling. But um, then I was divorced about five years ago and it was a massive wake up call because I had just been a stay at home mom and was just homeschooling my kids. And we we're just going down the you know path that the vision that I had for my family. And then all of a sudden now I have to enter the professional world. And not only did I find that I was completely unprepared for it because I had been just a homeschooling mom for so long that I was not really truly preparing my children to to move from, okay, you're educated like in a classical form. So you're a critical thinker and you're a creative thinker, but actually into professionalism to be able to provide themselves as a resource um, to the world, whether it's, you know, the, an entrepreneurial place, but also, you know, working in an organization or something like that. And it just seems like maybe you could help me wrap my head around because I feel like I'm still struggling with that, you know, and I've got a junior and a senior this year and a 22 year old that still lives at home. <laughs> and um, just trying to like, because I feel like I'm not equipped, truthfully, to be able to to propel them into um, the, all the successes that they're created to have. Yeah. 